Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. This is the 10th episode of the Move Your Mind limited construction series. We're doing this because every year 190 Australians working in the construction industry take their own lives and construction workers are six times more likely to die from suicide than an accident at work. On today's episode, I spoke to Rebecca Casson, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Master Builders Victoria. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to moveyourmind.me and join the Move Your Mind community, or you can buy the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com slash book. Rebecca, thank you so much for making the time to come on the podcast. It's certainly a pleasure. It's delightful to see you and uh, I'm excited for the interview. Yeah, same here. And, you know, really, it's been great doing this this series, this construction series, and um, the feedback we've had has been phenomenal. I, I think what we've realised is there just needs to be, you know, more conversation in this industry. Um, and it's starting to happen, but I think it's, you know, something that we can't sort of talk about enough. So, you know, I really appreciate, you know, you people like yourself uh, making the time to just come and share insights and, and come on here because I, I know it definitely helps. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, such an important subject in our industry and uh, and I'm delighted to talk about it. I think that what I've actually found is that certainly because of my gender, uh, and, and I don't mean to genderize the, the, the dialogue, but um, I do believe that because of my gender, I've been able to say a lot more in terms of mental health than uh, perhaps has been said before from an industry perspective. So uh, you mm. know, perhaps we can talk a bit about that later on. Absolutely. No, that would be super interesting to talk about. So I guess before we go into all of that, are you able to give um, a background on yourself and basically what you do and how you came to doing what you do now? Yeah, sure. Well, um, you probably know I'm the first woman to be appointed as the CEO of Master Builders Victoria in the organisation's 147 year history. Um, And uh, but actually, today is my last day in the role. After four years, I've just announced that I'm going to be stepping down. So you've got this exclusive recording as the last ever interview that I'm actually going to be doing as the CEO of Master Builders Victoria. So um, it's uh, it's with much sadness that I that I leave. But there's um, some exciting things on the horizon. In fact, I've agreed to continue to be involved with the building construction industry. Uh, yesterday, I was appointed as the president of Inkalink, uh, the first woman actually to be appointed in the organisation's 34 year history, and. Um, and I'm also going to remain connected. I'm the Victorian government's chairperson of the uh, Building Industry Consultative Council. Um, and I was the first woman to be appointed in uh, that group's 21-year uh, history. So um, th- there's a lot of glass ceilings that I've been able to kind of punch through uh, in that space. Um, and uh, those part-time positions are actually going to enable me to take a much needed break uh, during the summer to recharge, which, as you know, from a mental health perspective, is really important uh, to focus on that and um, continue with my academic studies and explore other career opportunities with a fresh mind in the new year. So it's been been a long, hard slog um, over COVID particularly. So, um, but you asked me... Uh, uh, how I got to where I am today and a mm. um, bit of a, a convoluted story. So I, I tried to skip through some of it, but I, I didn't anticipate that I would ever be working in the building construction industry. In fact, when I lived in England, um, and that's where I'm from originally, I had the opportunity to work in private legal practice, but I realised it wasn't for me. And I instead chose to serve my community and work in public service. And through my government work, I became involved in various international engagement projects. And I worked with a a wonderful man called Baron Bruce Lockhart, who was a very skilled politician, had a great vision for establishing global networks. And he actually wanted to broaden um, links beyond what England had in terms of Europe and engage with uh, the USA, uh, developing special relationships, particularly with the Commonwealth of Virginia. And when I was working in Virginia to create economic engagement opportunities, tourism, trade, education, uh, I was actually approached by the federal government in the US to um, take on the inaugural role as executive director of the British Committee for Jamestown, which was established to commemorate America's 400th anniversary. 
And Jamestown is a very special place where the uh, first English ships landed in 1607 and became the first permanent English speaking settlement in North America. And uh, so if you know the Pocahontas story, you'll know all about that. And this was a career highlight for me because it was only commemorated once every 50 years. And um, I got to work with some very influential and senior individuals, Lord Watson of Richmond, Sir Robert Worcester, um, and an influential board, members of the House of Lords and Parliament. And that happened, the commemoration happened in 2007. And um, there was lots of work in the lead up. We had to work with Buckingham Palace and the Queen came over and um, the Virginia Indians, the indigenous people participated in the commemoration. Um, and I was tasked with developing all of those relationships and everything. And of course, when that came to an end, in 2007, uh, I thought, well, what, what could beat mm. that? And came on a holiday to Australia in, in 2007. And it was actually the Victorian government that sponsored me to come out on a skilled migration visa. And one of the conditions was that I had to live and work in regional Victoria. And uh, well, I'd never know, I didn't know where regional Victoria was, so I had to Google it. And uh, so I chose to live in Geelong from Google Earth moved there with no jobs to come to nowhere no one you know didn't know anyone and um, my daughter was nine year old at uh, nine years old at the time and uh, it was really interesting to move to a place where I had to restart my whole career and uh, really push me out of my comfort zone and you know thinking about that about resetting things but also it's quite liberating as well um, and uh, and certainly it's one of the best things that I've ever done one of my most favorite achievements and I, I did a bit of work in Geelong uh, and then um, part of that work was to be the CEO of the committee for Geelong uh, and I actually started in that role at the time when Ford and Alcoa announced that they were closing their manufacturing operations in the city and Shell announced it was selling the refinery so it was a, a massive time of change for the city and of course it's going great guns now and Part of that work was a collaboration with the United Nations Global Compact Cities Program, RMIT University as well, and undertook a lot of research. And part of that also centered on the building construction industry, elements of that too. And uh, that's when I was approached to do this job. And I started my role at Master Builders in 2019. So yeah, that's kind of like how I, how I became uh, to be the CEO of Master Builders Victoria. And of course, never an easy uh, decision to decide to step down it's mm. never um you know as some of your listeners will know these types of job are, jobs are exceptionally tough and we might speak about the pandemic in a moment um but with the conclusion of some significant change initiatives that i'm really proud to have overseen during my time in the association i know it's the right time for me to hand over the baton it feels a little bit like jumping out of the plane without a parachute but you know, I really know that it's important for my mental health to, to really have the courage to, to make that decision. And there are obvious benefits that come with experience and longevity in a role, but it should always be balanced with the need for renewal. And, you know, I've got a wonderful team at Master Builders Victoria, amazing members, but I've got a great sense of confidence and strong sense of pride that, as you, you know, the organisation is going to move forward with the next phase of leadership. And I'm really looking forward to my role um, as the newly named president of Incalink and remaining closely connected with the industry. Um, and I might talk a bit more about Incalink and the work that it's doing in the mental health and wellbeing space later on. So, yeah, that's a, a bit of a, a 30,000 foot view, as they say in the States, of, of how I got to where I am today. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you for sharing that. And I think we'll probably need to do a, um, a follow up interview to just fit everything in because you've done a huge amount and it feels like a common theme that, you know, you've had in your life is really listening to your gut, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, I guess, as you're saying, as you are now, as you did when you, you know, moved to Australia. And I think it's a really important message because I think we often, because of fear of the unknown or, um, you know, expectation or what we should do, we don't always do what we actually need to do for ourselves because it's scary and you don't know what's going to happen. So I think, that's a really good message. And um, before I go into the next question, I've got a very important question. You lived in Geelong. Are you a Geelong supporter in the AFL? Because <laughs> myself and my family are completely, it's like a religion for us. 
I know, I know absolutely that, um, you know, about your connections to uh, the cats and, um, and it was not an option for me. Uh, <laughs> it was like when I moved to Geelong, it was akin to having, uh, I'm not, I, I didn't really know much about AFL and I'm a soccer, I was a soccer fan in, um, you know, foot, like proper football in England. Mm. Um, it was akin to having Manchester United on your doorstep, but yeah. you'd never get David Beckham, you know, at the local cafe who was so happy to sign autographs and everything else like that. And, um, you know, Cameron Ling, and that was at the time when I was working very closely with the Geelong Football Club, Brian Cook, Frank Costa. Mm. I did a lot of work um, with them in my previous role to actually raise the money uh, to um, to develop Cadinia Park Stadium. And in fact, um, I served on the inaugural Cadinia Park Stadium Trust um, when that was established by the Victorian government. So yeah, my passion for the Geelong Football Club, for the cats, for the community in Geelong remains. I still have properties down in Geelong and I spend a lot of time there. Um, and it's been a great place to raise my daughter and, um, you know, and to, to have a family. So it's been um, it's been a good place for me. And I'm, I'm very, very glad that I Googled, um, you know, regional <laughs> Victorian, decided on Geelong. There were a few other options, but I, might, I won't name the, the other ones that I decided not to choose. But you could probably imagine what they were. Yeah, no, no. But I, yeah, exactly. I think Geelong is a very good option. Uh, so how, how has the experience been for you being you know, having such a demanding role and being in that position in, in a male dominated industry. Yeah, look, it has, uh, it's certainly not for the faint hearted. Mm. Um, and there's been some really great things. Um, and there's been some really big challenges. And, and I might perhaps use COVID as, a, as an example of yeah. how, perhaps, um, as a woman, I have been able to bring extra um, skills into that space that perhaps being male dominated in the past might have not have had the same outcome. So, um, you know, the, the, the way that, that COVID started back in 2020 uh, was, you know, really, um, really quite confronting. I remember saying, you know, we, we're going to put every, we we're going to have everyone working from home. Mm. And I remember um, there were certain people that suggested that I was being histrionic, uh, that it was just, you know, a, a, the flu and it was just going to pass over in a few weeks. And how wrong were they? Mm. And I said, you know, I need to have my team working from home so that when things get really bad, that we know that w our stuff is sorted out and that we can actually um, service our members from a strong base um, and we did that within one week um, wow. and and we never missed a beat but the you know there were ever-changing rules and ensuring please uh, you know people were safe it was um it was a really uh, challenging time and we tried to keep businesses open and um you know there are 111,000 building and construction businesses in Victoria and it a lot of that fell to uh, master builders Victoria everyone was looking at ours but as it became clear that, uh, that the pandemic was enormous I very quickly realized that it wasn't looking good and that we really had to successfully adapt and um, I actually brought together um, the unions and the employer associations and persuaded them to collaborate effectively to pursue some really positive goals and outcomes and as you might have heard you know the there was a a, a real um a really challenging relationship between the unions um, and master builders in the past um and but but I managed to really uh, working with the CFMEU particularly uh, to collaborate in a way that had never been seen before and and I was appointed as the chair of a, a collaborative group of employer associations and unions known as the big one the building industry group operating as one um, and that was the group that really 
you know, uh, cut through a lot of the things and um, and uh, consistently and collaborated, uh, you know, collaborated together, helped our sector to navigate those very sensitive issues, uh, the vaccination mandates, the worksite restrictions and the shutdowns. And uh, it was a very confronting time, but it was really important. You know, I remember people saying to me, oh, let's just get to April 2020, Easter. Let's just mm. get to Easter. If we can get to Easter without being shut down, then that will be really important. And I just returned from a study tour, the first Australian-led post-pandemic um, building construction industry um, study tour. And we went to Brussels, London, Birmingham, Washington, New York. I could have stopped in and said hi to you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Scotland. And, you know, we didn't realise that most of those places actually shut down their whole building and construction industry for three months. Wow. And, and we kept going. And that was because we worked together, the unions and the employer associations that was led by me and John Secker at the time. And we gave confidence to our industry. We gave confidence to the government to, to make sure that they knew that we could keep our sites safe and open. And that really put food, continued to put food on the table for a lot of Victorians, you know, and um, there was a lot of advocacy work and uh, it was a time like no other in recent memory. Mm. Uh, and it was really significant challenge for our industry. And, you know, everyone worked tirelessly and it really was such a wild ride. It was really confronting at times. Um, and but the pandemic taught us to adapt and collaborate. And, um, you know, I'm proud to say that that the approach that we took in Victoria certainly set the scene nationally with other industry associations and unions. And people have said to me that they've never seen the cooperation in decades that was essential through the pandemic, particularly, as I said, between Master Builders Victoria and the CFMEU. And, um, and that uh, was a real standout. And particularly, I know that it made a massive difference to the Victorian government when they engaged with us because they could see that we were speaking with one voice um, and we were moving as one. Um, and that was so important. Um, and in fact, as, as part of that work, I was actually inducted into the Victorian honour roll of women in the category of leading through disaster, which was another career highlight for me. And you mentioned about working in a male dominated industry. And I think mm. that using um, my gender um, and the skills that come uh, you know, sometimes with, with not all women, but 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 certainly with me, the ability to be able to uh, negotiate in such a way that uh, engenders that spirit of cooperation and collaboration for those people that want to collaborate and cooperate, of course. Um, but I do, when I look back, consider that what we achieved through that pandemic, um, I realised that it would have taken as many more years to implement the necessary changes and build the relationships that we had to develop in an instant in such a short space of time. We were working hundreds of hours each week. It was 24 seven, seven days a week. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm certainly exceptionally honoured to, for the part that I played in helping our industry navigate that pandemic never want to repeat it again um, but I certainly know that that you know my contribution helped to keep food on the table for many families and you know where where lots of people struggled so I'll always be proud of that absolutely I mean it takes a a, a lot of leadership skills and just strong character to to do that and and I guess you would have had to be learning as you went because there's no rule book for that kind of situation and it's sort of a uh, trial and error you know scenario so um it's a pretty I, I can imagine you wouldn't want to repeat it again but something to be super proud of and um the next question sort of got two parts to it uh in general you know what are what 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 is mental health like in 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 this industry um is it improving are there is there more sort of discussion more services and the second part to that what was what how do you feel COVID impacted mental health in the industry thank you so much for supporting move your mind we're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in the book is available globally you can find all of the links at nickbrax.com book and we've just released the move your mind community we've currently got a men's community group a women's community group, a general group. We're going to be lo loading up other groups. 
and you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events, we've got courses, we've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to, to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it and we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. Well, I'm, I'm going to take the first one, the last one first. Yeah. I think COVID really impacted mental health in the industry. You had people um, that were stressed about the virus, um, about themselves, about knowing how to handle the situation. Um, I really like the, the work of Brene Brown and she talks a lot about anxiety um, and change, you know, and I think that for the first time ever, people didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, and there was, um, you know, the fake news and everything else. And, and people were just truly frightened. Mm. Um, and, you know, the importance of having confidence and showing leadership, despite the fact that you don't know what's going on as well. That was, you know, a lot of us had to dig really deep, but that did take its toll on a lot of people and mental health, a lot of people. So um, I think that uh, it it really some of that is only just starting to come to the fore. I think people talk about having PTSD from COVID, but it, it's actually a real thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and that I think that the services are struggling in that regard, and people were in their houses um, together, people suffering from different aspects of mental health issues, and uh, you know, so so it, COVID brought to the fore a lot of things, whether it was marital difficulties, marriage breakdowns, you know, um, domestic family violence, you know, those sorts of issues, it all kind of bubbled and, and surfaced. And, you know, so as I move then into the, the first question, which is about the state of mental health in the building construction industry, I do remain deeply concerned that our industry still has the highest rate of suicide in any sector. And research actually shows that an Australian building or construction worker takes their own life every two days. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really confronting statistic. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, this, um, this was brought to the fore earlier on this year. It's hard to get your head around that, that statistic. It's, um, yeah. It's absolutely it's insane. Horrific. And, you know, the very, very sad, um, uh, death of Mario Baezin, and I, I find it still difficult to talk about it without mm. crying. In fact, at my leaving event last night, Mario's uh, widow and his daughter were there at my leaving event, and I was really sad not to see him there. We worked very closely together, but mm. Mario mm. was the um, the the founder, the co-founder and CEO of Metricon, which was Australia's uh, largest home builder. And um, and his death earlier on this year was very confronting to lots of people, but brought that to the fore in a lot of ways and really sort of highlighted that building construction doesn't have a national approach to uh, responds, responding to mental health. Mm -hmm. There were lots of, you know, lots of organizations doing great work and I might get to that, but you know, it's really important. These facts the the very confronting facts about um you know workers taking their lives every two days if you really get get your head around that it's alarming uh, but more and more importantly it's preventable you know yeah. and um really maintaining physical and mental well-being it should be a priority for all of us but particularly in building construction and it's a mm. shared responsibility for employers and employees and everyone's got to play their part and as I mentioned there's lots of amazing work being done and and if you'll allow me perhaps I might just focus on one organization I've mentioned them already right, yeah. earlier Inklink which mm. um, actually does have a focus on mental health and well-being and this great organization it's actually the largest worker entitlement fund in Australia and it provides a, a safety net for workers in the building and construction industry where permanency and continuity of employment are significant issues, which is another area, you know, when people can sort of perceive that, <coughs> excuse me, the project that they're working on is coming to an end. The uncertainty um, of it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And the transient nature of building construction projects, you know, when you've yep. finished building a hospital and you've got to move mm -hmm. on to another work site, that can actually take a toll on people as well. But 
Interlink members really get security, you know, of redundancy payments, portable sick leave, income protection, insurance, and, and also uh, industry best training as well. I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, uh, Inklink is the largest funder of industry uh, best training in, in Australia. And the funds that um, Inklink um, have under management ha help to support that. Inklink um, actually funds health and wellbeing support through the investment of um, member entitlements. And, mm. um, you know, its programs include counselling and um, the Blue Hats Suicide Prevention Program. And mm. it does on-site health checks and um, vaccinations and, you know, actually puts some reinvestment back into the industry, as I mentioned, through funding programs. And it, it really is a, an organisation that brings together employer associations and unions as well, which as mm. I've already mentioned, is really important. And it's an employer association, it's an employer group, it's a safety net for workers um, and workers' mental health in our industry. So, and it actually, um, over the past 30 years, and many people don't realise it, but Inklink has gone from providing a basic chaplaincy to a full counselling service and a range of mental health and education programmes, which, which is actually delivered on site to workers. And um, the suite of services that the organisation offers includes counselling and on-site mental health, education, toolbox talks, drug and alcohol support services, financial counselling, which is so important as well, and, and, a, and a really important peer-to-peer -peer prevention uh, programme, which is called Blue Hats. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the programme actually was launched in 2018, and that was in response to the, the increased suicide rate in the industry. And it's actually delivered in partnership with WorkSafe, which is another great organisation, CBAR similarly, and mm. they also co-fund it. And, and it was actually envisaged to be a gatekeeper, a peer support program. Um, and it actually ed educates workers to really identify those early signs of suicidality and psychological distress in both themselves and in others. And, mm. um, you know, that's the thing is knowing what the signs are um, is a real challenge in that space, particularly when, when you're not attuned to those things. And Inklink actually delivers a one hour general awareness session on site to all workers. And that's really important to know what some of those triggers are. And then, then volunteers are asked to participate in an additional one day specific program uh, to become what we call a blue hat. And there's a full day course um, and there's round tables and annual conferences and graduates of the Blue Hats training program are actually provided with a distinctive Inkalink blue hat. It's a hard hat, a blue hard mm. hat um, to wear on site so that they can be identified as being trained and actually available to chat. Um, and, and that's important because sometimes people don't know, they don't, they don't feel comfortable in talking to other people. And of course, when, when you sort of say, in, in, you know, are you okay? And actually sometimes it can be quite confronting when someone turns around and said, no, actually I'm, I'm not doing yeah. very well. And people don't know how to respond to that. Yeah. Um, and blue hats, once they're trained, they acquire that knowledge and skills and they actually provide that peer to peer um, on site peer support for workers and you know um, those workers that have got suicide or mental health concerns and they actually provide referrals to support services and Inkalink is this is the organization that that actually facilitates those referrals and it really is uniquely placed because it's got that you know to deliver that peer support suicide program it's got an in-house counseling service um, for workers to be referred to. And it actually, the service is known and trusted in our industry. And perhaps I'll just tell you a bit more about that in a moment. But uh, it's really important to note that during COVID, um, the Blue Hats program actually was redeveloped for online delivery. I, I talk a lot about what COVID has taken away from us, but I also focus, try to focus having a glass half full mentality and great optimism of what COVID um, did for us and one of the many innovations that was brought about because of the pandemic was the creation of the digital blue hats program yep. which actually enabled Inkalink to deliver the program interstate and in regional Victoria uh, where on-site delivery had actually been a real challenge previously because of the geography as well so there are now over 
um, to 500 workers on site across Victoria in their distinctive blue hats, um, mm -hmm. uh, offering this really vital service to their mates, uh, you know, with over 100 workers already putting their hand up to be trained next year. And, you know, my shout out to anyone um, listening to this podcast or watching it is, you know, we need more volunteers. We need to raise the awareness of this. And, um, you know, just as I close, I mentioned earlier about Inklinks counselling service. And again, many people don't realise, but this service is available to workers and their family members. And it's fully funded. Like it's it's fully funded by Inkalink's investment returns, meaning it's free, free to workers and their family yeah. members. Yeah. And that yeah. removes the financial barrier because, you know, a lot of people really go, I'm, I'm not feeling well, um, but I can't afford to take time off work. I can't afford the medical bills. I can't afford to go and see a counsellor or I can't afford to see a clinical psychologist or other or seek support um, because they're worried about financial stress. And this service is free. Um, and that really does remove that barrier. Um, members are provided with 10 sessions, they're free, and um, it provides a referral pathway also to other services, just you know, like GP, the mental health plans, psychologists, relationship counseling services, and detox and re rehabilitation services as well. Um, and in 2020, the service went online in COVID. Um, you know, where many other services were prevented from running, this service went online. So mm -hmm. we were able keep running through all of that time um, for workers and you know the online option remains and most workers actually choose to do online counseling sessions you can mm. do it from your car you can do it from your bedroom you know and um, and it really is good that choice of video counseling again removing that barrier to actually turn up somewhere physically um, you know a lot of people talk about shame um, but, you know, you, you've got to be in that arena and, um, you know, really not having to actually physically turn up somewhere, I think is, is very helpful to someone. Um, and, uh, you know, my message again to anyone, I, I delivered a, a speech at the Master Builders um, Excellence in Housing Awards last month and um, spoke about uh, a scholarship that uh, Inkling had sponsored for the Mario Biasin uh, scholarship for the Master Builders Foundation. And I said this, you know, it's important for everyone to remember uh, that you're not alone. And they're not just, you know, um, motherhood and apple pie statements. There's a lot of people yeah. out, a lot of organizations out there. And to anyone that is struggling, you know, please seek help. And I know that it's difficult because sometimes people don't identify that they need help. Um, uh, but people might just be feeling a bit discombobulated, a bit out of sorts, a bit out of the ordinary. Um, and the message is that Inkalink and other organisations are here to support you. And uh, it's really important to access those services. And there's no shame in it at all. And you won't be judged by it. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter. Some people see broken legs um, and the physical injuries that you can see that are really sometimes quite easy to treat. And people perhaps tend to think that mental illness, mental health issues um, are embarrassing and they're not. They mm. must be treated in the same way, um, you know, as uh, as physical bodily, um, you know, um, ailments as well. And there's no shame in that at all. Um, and so people can learn more about Inkalink's Blue Hats program or counselling service, and you can visit inkalink.org.au. Big shout out to the to the organisation for the great work that they do, because I know that they've actually saved a lot of lives and a lot of families, um, and their work is excellent and ongoing. So, yeah, I'm really pleased to be able to share that with you today. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And for anyone listening, we'll we'll have that link in the show notes, so you'll be able to click on that and go straight to Inkalink and and check it out. So thank you so much for sharing. And I think there's so many more things we can talk about. And also I feel very privileged to have you um, as your, you know, final um, interview and, you know, discussion before before you sort of finish up. So thank you for making the time. Um, we finish every episode with five closing questions. So these are just sort of um, whatever answer comes to mind. Um, so nothing too crazy. I'm not going to throw you under the bus here, but um the first one is, what's your best childhood memory that comes to mind? Wow. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I had a, a very, I had a wonderful childhood and, you know, a big shout out to my parents who did an amazing job. Um, but if I could choose 
a best childhood memory would be going on a holiday with my uh, parents uh, to um, Germany where my auntie and uncle lived and spending um, New Year's there and seeing um, an, a European, a proper European fireworks, mm. you know, on New Year's Eve that night and everyone was, you know, cold and it was snowing mm. and the fireworks were going off and um, our whole family was there and enjoying that and um, yeah I used to love those uh, those those Christmases and those New Year's in in Europe so yeah that would be a great childhood memory. I love that what what would you say is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society or one of the Um, biggest? I think I, I think it's multifaceted. I think that the biggest burden is is people uh, feeling that shame and not feeling that they can actually speak up about the things that they're experiencing because of that shame. I think it's getting better. I think many years ago, you know, if you uh, if you said that you had um, you know mental health issues or difficulties or challenges, um, that it was very taboo. But I think that that's that's starting to change now, um, which is really great. But I think the burden as well is about access to services. We've seen through the pandemic that, you know, a lot of people have got mental health plans. You know, I've I've got a mental health plan. um, And, you know, I'm certainly not ashamed to say it It was a lot to deal with. Mm. Um, I went to my doctors and and I, and I said, you know, I I need, uh, I need support in that space. Um, But I know that the services were overburdened. Um, So I think investment in, uh, mental health services and you know bringing more people over I, I just visited um, you know as I said I went overseas visited all of those places and we're not alone like this yeah. is a global phenomenon right so um, Australia has a really important um, there's an, an important time now to bring more skilled migrants over to Australia and especially those that have got you know mental health um, qualifications um, you know and uh, to be able to help our those services and, and, and increase the services and the funding in that space so that we can be a, a very healthy and well society and community moving forward post pandemic I think that's going to be really super important. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with that. And it is so important to, you know, have as many services available and to go and, you know, use these services and everyone listening should, you know, if you if you are feeling like you you need help, it, it is out there and you need to, you know, reach out. I, I always say the the one thing when it comes to mental health that you should not do is nothing, you know, just do something, whether it's uh, talking to a friend, going and getting professional help, or if you don't know where to go, literally just go on Google and, you know, type in free mental health helpline or whatever, just take that, make that first call. And that can lead you to, you know, making the necessary steps to go and to go and get help. So I think it's yeah super important. Uh, what's your personal definition of happiness? Uh, I think contentment um, and uh, I experienced a, a, a happiness yesterday. It's probably not answering your question um, correctly, but uh, I talk a lot about like, you know, I was speaking at my leaving due yesterday and and, I, and I'm leaving this role with, with not another job to go to. Um, yep. And, but I know it's the right thing to do. Um, it's the right time. It's the right time for me from a mental health perspective. It's, it's the right thing to do um, for, uh, for me. And it's never an, an easy time, as I've mentioned. So I've, you know, happiness for me is knowing that I have the courage to back myself um, and to know that, uh, that the universe is going to look after me in a nice way. Um, and uh, I do a lot of mindfulness and, um, you know, I think that it's important. So for me, having the courage uh, to to make really difficult decisions makes me happy, uh, mm-hmm. knowing that I've got I I can back myself. You know, I've got I've got I've got my I've got my own back. You know, um, yeah. and, and that is a that is a pathway to happiness. There's no point in in staying in something uh, if you're unhappy, whether it's a a job or a marriage or a you know relationship or a, a you know standing in the middle of the supermarket. If you're not happy, well just change it you know you, you've got the you've got the ability to do it so yeah. that for me is the definition of happiness 
I think that's a really great point. You know, we all, we can often feel stuck, but we do have the power, maybe not to change everything overnight, but to make some f- sort of step forward to start that process of making the change. So yeah, really like that one. Um, so two more, uh, what are you most afraid of? My name is Nick Brax and I'm a storyteller who has dedicated my entire adult life to creating positive conversations around mental health. In recent years, discussions around mental health have become less taboo and entered the mainstream vernacular. I've delivered over 1,000 mental health seminars around the globe, including several TED Talks, and I believe we all have a story to tell. In my book, Move Your Mind, I cover my story and stories from people that inspire me, as well as insights from world-leading mental health experts. This book will help you to learn how to recognize mental health issues before they become a problem. Use your personal challenges as motivators, take ownership of your well-being, and create new daily habits that increase happiness and reduce stress. Oh, that's a big one. I think, um, you know, my daughter is 23. I think I'm most afraid of her. She is like, <laughs> she's formidable. Um, and, um, and I think that uh, I'm, I'm most afraid of not making enough difference, uh, particularly in the type of role that I've just had. I, I'm most afraid of the fact that I haven't done enough um, to secure a pathway for her and others that come after me. Yeah. And um, you know, that's a big burden. Um, and I'm, I, I'm most afraid of that uh, in many respects. But um, yeah, I, I would hope that I have taught my daughter and I've mentored many other women over the last many years in my career and I would hope that the the lessons that I've taught taught them and um and the the things that they've seen me do um will mean that that they don't have to be fearful and that they don't have to you know um experience some of the things that I've experienced um and had to experience being afraid particularly Mm -hmm. in a male-dominated industry um and uh and showing that you know things can be different and um and that you don't have to be afraid in those spaces yeah absolutely well final one and i'm sure there's many many things that you can um come up with for this this one but what are you most proud of yeah that is a that's a big one like i could go on for four days um, (laughs) Uh, Even, yeah, from what I've heard, I could name about 10. So from what you've just told me in this interview. You go ahead and answer them for me then. (laughs) I um, Look, I, I, it's always with a sense of trepidation that I talk about um, achievements and pride. Um, Of course, I'm, I'm very, as I mentioned, my daughter, I'm very proud of her. She's an amazing, amazing woman. Um, And so that's one of the best things, best achievements of my life. Um, but I think that it's timely for me to mention that I'm most proud of the achievements that I that I have made at Master Builders, being the first woman appointed to that organisation in the association's 147 years, um, and all of the things that came with that through leading, you know, through a pandemic, you know, there mm. was an formal inquiry and investigation that I had to lead the organisation through um, when I first started, which was, you know, to address things that happened before I got there. And, um, you know, and, and all of those things are, I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud of the legacy that I've left. Uh, but it's very important uh, for me to underscore that none of that could have been achieved without the great team that I have had. Um, you know, working alongside me. Uh, people, I always say people don't work for me, they work with me. And, yeah. um, and you know, of course, the support from the board and the members as well. So I'm very proud of that. And, um, and as I said at my leaving event last night, that um, my time at Master Builders is up there with, you know, working with Buckingham Palace and, um, mm. and the Virginia Indians. And, you know, I had a great sense of pride when I'm, when I had to negotiate with the Virginia Indians, the tribal chiefs to try to encourage them to, to be part of the commemoration back in 2007. And that was a, a great sense of pride uh, that I managed to, um, to get that across the line. So, so these sorts of achievements are, are very much up there, but notwithstanding the fact that these are not lone achievements, that they take a lot of effort and energy from a whole group of people as well. So 
yeah, that's a rambling answer, but yeah, timely in terms of my departure from Master Builders. Yeah, well, look, I really appreciate you, especially, you know, with where with everything going on for you at the moment and finishing up at Master Builders, making the time to to have this chat, love everything you're doing and really appreciate you coming on and, you know, sharing your story. And uh, I'm sure everyone listening to this will take a lot out of it. So I appreciate you making the time and hopefully we can, you know, do it again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly my pleasure. And thank you to you for shedding a little light on these really important issues uh, that confront everyone. And, um, you know, and I think it's a real credit to you and, and everyone else that's taken the time to listen to this podcast, because that means that they're all so keen and interested to learn more and to know more and to address their own mental health uh, issues and, um, you know, or to help other people as well. So you keep up your great work. And, and then once again, to anyone out there that's struggling, you know, our door is always open and, um, and there's no shame in, in asking for help. In fact, it's a, it's a really courageous thing to do. So, um, you know, I hope that people get something from this and um, I look forward to working with you again, Nick and, and others on the call. Um, on the podcast, um, you know, in my new role in, as the president of Inca Lincoln and, and in my other positions as well to continue to raise the profile of this really, really important issue, which is very personally important to me as well. Well, really appreciate it and best of luck with the next steps. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. So thanks so much again for coming on. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks to Rebecca Casson for joining me today for Move Your Mind. If you'd like to join the Move Your Mind community, you can go to moveyourmind.me. And if you'd like to purchase the Move Your Mind book, you can go to nickbrax.com book.